Welcome to uh, Jack's Conversations with uh, Professor Theodore Goodson III, uh, who I'm delighted to welcome uh, today. He's the Richard Barry Bernstein Collegiate Professor of Chemistry, Macromolecular Sciences and Engineering at the University of Michigan. And um, I don't want to take any time um, going through the details. I'll leave that to you to do sort of a mini introduction, uh, Ted. Well, thanks, Eric. I appreciate it and appreciate uh, having this conversation. Um, yeah, my research, I'm at the University of Michigan, also a professor in chemistry and in, in, um, macromolecular engineering, but also in applied physics. And the, the group has uh, got, um, you know, chemists, physical chemists, organic materials chemists, um, and it's got engineers, chemical engineers, material science and engineers, and it's got physicists. And we basically use um, ultrafast and nonlinear and quantum optical spectroscopy to investigate new materials that could have applications in communication and other kinds of effects. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions I want to address to you. Um, the last one um, will be with respect to the Journal of the American Chemical Society, since you are now uh, on the editorial advisory board. But um, let me start off with some general questions before then I move into the somewhat more personal. Um, you know, a question that often comes up to anybody who's a chemist is, how does chemistry stay relevant uh, today and well into the future? But how does someone as yourself, uh, as accomplished as you are, ensure that it stays relevant? Well, I guess the, the good thing about working with uh, Jax and I also work with JPC is being aware of the new discoveries um, you know, as you probably know, a lot of science is related to instrumentation and discovery of new processes. And when um, discoveries happen in that realm, it opens up new avenues for chemistry as well. And so we're now just coming into light of some new opportunities and in, in things like in spectroscopy and using light and things in other areas of solar and so on that have uh, ramifications to what we understand in chemistry. And so I think that our place in chemistry in the future is recognizing these new opportunities and acting on them, as opposed to only doing the things we've been doing for the last you know, few decades. Yeah, I think you certainly hit the uh, nail on the head in my discipline. Uh, the advances in analytical technologies uh, have made all the difference in the world in terms of the quantities that we can work with, and the kind of problems that uh, we can address. And I'm sure that's the case also for the widely different fields that you seem to cover in your research group. Right, so for example, um, now we're starting to use or investigate the process of using different kinds of light. Um, you know, light might look the same to most people, but not only does it, you can change its color and the amplitude and the frequency, um, but you also can change the statistics of the photons in the light. And, and we're starting to use that property of light now. Now that, uh, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, physicists and electrical engineers have worked out a lot of details about that. I think we're all where we're at because we can identify certain um, uh, mentors or, or heroes um, that we wanted to be like. Who, who were your mentors? Who were your heroes in chemistry? In chemistry? Um, or in, sci my, in science yeah, in general. In my, probably my parents. No, I mean, I, I, uh, the reason why I say in chemistry is because, and certainly he, my parents are my heroes, uh, more broadly speaking, period, right? But, you know, my dad was organic chemist, okay? And so, um, and he really got me involved in organic chemistry um, very early in high school, um, doing real organic chemistry, as he would say, right? But well, what happened and to then, you then, huh? <laughs> yeah, and, I, and, I, and then I let him down, right? <laughs> but actually, it, was, it wasn't that. It was, um, I was actually a music major um, when I started college, and I, and I was a double major in chemistry as well. And so, um, and then, um, you know, about the junior year, it, it didn't look so promising with the music, right? You know, and so, in his words, you know, well, there's always chemistry, right? So, um, but I was really interested in quantum mechanics. And understanding quantum mechanics, and I still am. And so, actually, even though I turned onto physical chemistry, and I wasn't going to be an organic chemistry, a chemist, um, the, you know, he was at the, in Eli Lilly, by the way, it's in Indianapolis. Oh, yeah. Um, it looks like they have turned around, and now they want to be physical. It's interesting that you bring up music. I think most um, successful scientists, such as yourself, uh, have a musical connection um, in one way or another. Um, I play the saxophone. 
and um, oh, the same cool saxophone. Instrument, I, huh? Yeah, and the same saxophone I played starting in sixth grade all the way through college. Um, my son, he just graduated from high school last year, and he had played it from sixth grade through high school. But we retired it, and it, it had seen its last day, so I bought a new one. <laughs> I won't yeah. tell you what I play. That's not so cool. Um, I'm curious what you consider to be your biggest successes, the greatest accomplishments. So this can be as a researcher, as a mentor, um, as a teacher, or all of the above. No, my greatest accomplishment is having three children. <laughs> Um, but I guess probably, um, you know, in our laboratory, we have we have ventured out, um, and it's not the, the science that we did was excellent, and the papers we published have, are highly cited. But I would say the accomplishment is the student, um, who, you know, taking that journey with me, being brave enough to take that journey, and sticking your foot out, and saying something, right? Um, and then, and then us making it through the end with science. Um, that's the accomplishment, isn't it? We had some ideas and other cases, we had some ideas and we didn't actually know we're going to work. And we, and we didn't know the theory was even correct, right? It, it required saying, you know, we're confident enough in our ability to know the literature, to understand the theory, do the experiments, you know, many times to make sure we're doing something right talk to other people. Um, and I think those, those scientists that that process created is a great accomplishment. And it's a long lasting accomplishment, I think, right? Because they in turn will train other scientists and, and carry on your ideas and your way of approaching um, uh, problems. It's a fun profession that we have, I think you'll agree, right? Because we're teaching young minds, people that are ambitious, uh, optimistic. Uh, and, and that's always, I think that sort of contributes to us remaining young and optimistic to as much as it's possible, right? That's right, you, and you never know where it's gonna lead. I mean, um, you know, sometimes the, it's all about character, isn't it? So the, and that's the fun part. If everybody was like a robot and everybody behaved the same way, I don't think it would be half as fun as, as recognizing when the new students like they're doing now show up and, and you know that person's probably gonna join your group the interaction with that person and doing science, I wonder what effect that will have on us doing you know, something, right? And, right? and you can never tell. You can never tell the answer to that. Each of them has a different way of approaching a problem that you thought was going to be solved this way, but they're thinking outside the box and they find a better solution, right? A better approach. Right. And I think that's why it's important to have diversity. How do we become more inclusive in general and more diverse? The idea of inclusive probably starts with, you know, us here teaching at the university, right? Um, and, and it couldn't even start even for, uh, earlier, you know, down in the, in the in earlier ages. And I've run um, this, uh, what do they call it, Photon Fund. It's basically a, a rudimentary kind of laser um, understanding and safety kind of contest, right? But those activities don't seem to me to be all that inclusive when I look at the, the, the kids that come for that. And I, I think it starts there. Um, and that's a commitment, right? And so um, we need more commitments of those things at the beginning, um, which, you know, you, you can't draw a complete um, linear curve between that and someone ending up being a professor of chemistry or something. But at least their, their understanding of the scientific process. Um, and that, you know, so even though, um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of talk about inclusiveness and diversity um, I think the hard work, the long game has to be played here that you you're down and you're down in, you know, Ann Arbor Science Olympiad, you know, working with, you know, elementary kids on one day a week or something that has a longing effect. What we could do, of course, is to promote those kinds of positions, those kinds of careers. Um, if people can actually understand that it's it's a long game process right? it starts with something like the Science Olympiad and it eventually ends with something like a advanced degree. Yeah, I think you're totally correct there. I mean, we have to start um, promoting science at a much earlier age. I'm curious, how do you explain a photon to a 10 year old? Yes, so um, the, the actual physical exercise, the fun part is that they're in a dark room and each person gets a mirror and there's a, there's a, a focus, uh, you know, flashlight and they need to hit targets. That's the fun part. The, the science bit is 
um, understanding what a photon is, right? And of course, that's not such a trivial uh, thing to to tell even a professor, right? Um, <laughs> but uh, understanding that light has a frequency, it has a wavelength, it has um, it has a number, right? I'm always amazed when I go out uh, on a starry night and you look up and you realize those photons started some millions of years ago, right? That are now hitting my eye. That just blows my mind, right? Uh, so I've welcomed you uh, as a member of the advisory board um, in JAX at the start of this year. And I wanna ask you a few questions as it relates to um, a JAX. How do you see JAX um, evolving in this fast paced world that we, we live in? How, do, how does it stay relevant? Well, I mean, so the, the JAX, I think, and it's doing this, needs to you know retain that kind of um you know um example um for all the other journals of of what is considered you know the the best of you know our american chemical society journals um and highlighting right so jacks can't publish everything all the time but it certainly can highlight different areas and then that's what acs has all the specialty journals for right um, you know, it, it highlights it, and then that kind of sets the stage for the other journals to say, okay, this is an also important area, and they should do so. That's how they have to stay relevant. Somehow, the um, JAX has to also recognize areas that have never been really thought about before in the ACS journals. And that's done by having the people in the area um, who do the research. If you just invited your friends, you, you know that there would be lots of skepticism. So you, in the end, you actually do the, do your homework and, you, and that's where you discover, hey, this is kind of cool. Maybe I'll invite this person and see what happens, right? You know, and so, um, and that's when you find out there's, there could be something new. You'll find in the coming months that um, we're trying to build in some flexibility into the system so that we can be responsive, as you um, indicated, to, you know, rapid developments um, in the discipline so that we can incorporate uh, experts um, uh, in our associate editor board um, that can evaluate right. those fields. So what ha what has it done well, in your opinion, in the past, Jax? Probably the thing that um, had an impact on me was being able to highlight my work and publish in Jax when I was, you know, an assistant professor. I think Jax does a good job of that. I just see the people here in this department um, when they're young, when they get started, that, you know, if they're doing good work, they have a good shot of getting, you know, a paper in JAX before they come up for tenure or a couple, right? you know, and that really helps. It really helps the recognition of young people and their work um, and hopefully gets them invited to come and give seminars at different places. Um, and then if they really have something new to offer, it helps the field in general, right? And so JAX does a good job of that. I would say they do a good job. Well, Ted, I think we've um, reached the end of the um, allotted time for these interviews. It's been fun talking to you. I hope that we can meet up at an ACS meeting and have a beer. I think it'd be fun to have a more extensive conversation with you um, yeah, about science, like about chemistry, and ACS. Um, uh, yes. You've been great. Um, thank you, and um, have a good day.